Yeah, that's a good question. And the two get used interchangeably and they're, they're not quite the same thing. So iboga refers to a plant that grows in Africa, particularly in Gabon and Cameroon. And the Latin name is Tabernanth iboga. And there's a medicine that can be harvested from the root bark of this plant. And that medicine is iboga. Iboga has many alkaloids. One of the alkaloids is ibogaine. So when we talk about ibogaine, we're talking about the active constituent, if you will, of iboga. And now when we're talking about ibogaine, it doesn't necessarily even mean that we're talking about iboga because there are other ways now to get ibogaine. One way is from another plant species uh, called Voaconga africana. Uh, through a semi-synthetic process, ibogaine can actually be prepared and extracted from Voaconga africana. Um, which is a uh, growingly popular way of doing it because Tabernanth iboga, the original, the OG <laughs> ibogaine source, if you will, is an endangered species. So now we have another plant species that can provide this medicine to us. And there's also um, a new wave of research and a little bit of a, a patent race right now on creating a synthetic ibogaine. Um, that I don't know a whole lot about because I'm not in that world, but uh, iboga is the original plant from which we got the alkaloid ibogaine. So I specialize in integrative mental health in my practice, and I'm based in the United States where psychedelic medicines are not yet legal. I do think that's going to be changing in the near future. Um, and so while we're waiting for psychedelic medicines to become accepted and legalized uh, in the United States, we have this rampant addiction crisis, in particular, the opioid addiction. Um, and so Ibogaine is legal in Mexico. So I took a sabbatical last year I traveled to Mexico and I lived in Mexico for a few months where I had the complete honor to get to observe and work alongside my colleagues in the Ibogaine world, actually treating patients. Uh, some of them were coming just for psychospiritual exploration. They didn't have any kind of mental illness. Uh, some were there for depression. Uh, but most of the patients that we were working with were there specifically for help with opioid use disorder, which is a fancy way of saying opioid addiction. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes, it's like, where, where do I start? Um, first of all, the safety risks of taking Ibogaine. The safety risks are real. Ibogaine can prolong an interval in the cardiac rhythm, in the electrical signaling of the heart, so individuals do actually run the risk of going into cardiac arrest when they take ibogaine so for that reason it's recommended that before taking ibogaine a person actually has an ekg to assess the strength of their heart and that when they receive their flood dose that they are under medical supervision that someone is monitoring them um, ibogaine is also processed by the liver um, so you need to make sure the person has good liver function, as well as good kidney function. So at the centers where I was working, what they often said to their patients is, go to your doctor and have your doctor clear you for surgery. If you're cleared for surgery, then you're healthy enough to take Ibogaine. So that's one of the things I want to say. And I, I know that it's very popular for people to go rogue and want to just take psychedelics on their own. It's true that nobody owns plant medicine. It's given to all of us. And Ibogaine is the one that I go, yeah, really, please don't do that. Please just don't take Ibogaine at home. Please work with someone who knows what they're doing. Get a medical clearance beforehand because people do die from taking Ibogaine. Ibogaine deaths absolutely happen. Um, and even when people don't die, sometimes they go into cardiac arrest. They need to go to a hospital. They need to get a pacemaker. Um, but if you do your due diligence, that doesn't happen. So it's, it's the kind of medicine where due diligence is really, really important. Um, another thing I want to say about Ibogaine 
is it is getting a lot of attention now for treatment of opioid use disorder. Um, but the opioids aren't what they used to be. So not too long ago, when people had a drug problem and they were addicted to an opiate, they were addicted to heroin. They were injecting themselves with heroin, which was probably pure heroin. Or uh, they were using pills like OxyContin pills that they got prescribed to them by a doctor. And then they went to several states and had several doctors prescribe the same drugs or they were stealing it from their neighbors or, or whatnot. What we're seeing nowadays is in addition to all of those things, fentanyl has come onto the scene. And fentanyl is a synthetic opioid that is much stronger than any of the other opioids that we've had to date. Uh, and much more addictive. And so if somebody is using street drugs, even if they think that they're using heroin, they're using fentanyl more often than not. And so something that was uh, not quite surprising, but I will say quite depressing for me was every patient that came in, even if they insisted and swore up and down they weren't using fentanyl, we would still do a urine drug strain for fentanyl. And I was shocked at how many people were testing positive for fentanyl. A lot of people were testing positive for fentanyl. And as it turns out, Ibogaine does not work quite as well for treating fentanyl addiction as it does for treating heroin addiction or addiction to other kinds of opiates. I'm not saying it doesn't work. It still does. But the treatment is a lot longer and a lot hairier and a lot bumpier of a ride for the patient if they're using fentanyl. So I'm definitely going to tip some sacred cows here. And what I'm saying, I'm definitely going to ruffle feathers. Um, Kratom, for people who aren't familiar, that is an herbal medicine that comes to us from Southeast Asia, Thailand primarily. Um, and there are many different strains of Kratom, um, all of which are natural mu opioid agonists. So that means they have effect at our opioid receptors. That means that they have the potential to become addictive. Now, are they as harmful as getting addicted to OxyContin? No. Does it even hold a match to the harm of the fentanyl addiction? Absolutely not. But is Kratom addictive? Yes, it is. And I know I'm going to upset a lot of people by saying that, but you cannot, as, as Matthew Johnson once put it, you cannot take the mu opioid agonist out of the mu opioid agonist. It's just there. And... This is something that I'd kind of heard about and encountered arguments. I'm part of a lot of private groups for doctors and people in integrative medicine and people in the psychedelic industry. So I've definitely witnessed the, the war between practitioners who are pro-Kratom and anti-Kratom. Um, I will say I'm very pro-natural medicine and natural medicine has its risks too. I was absolutely shocked at how many of the patients we were treating with Ibogaine were coming to us specifically for Kratom addiction. And some of these patients were patients who were addicted to pharmaceutical opiates and then their doctor cut them off and then they switched to Kratom. So, you know, there, there was a transition point there. But some of the patients had never been hooked on a pharmaceutical opioid. They just started taking Kratom because they got a free sample at a conference or a friend gave them some, or a neighbor handed them a little bit, and they liked how it felt, and they started using it, and then yada, 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 now they're addicted to Kratom, and can we help them get off? Um, so that's an another little myth that I want to bust. Um, I've seen a lot of people addicted to Kratom, and it's uh, easier to get someone off of Kratom than it is to get someone off of fentanyl, and it's, it's still an ordeal. So I hope that if people are listening, if they're using Kratom, that they're being judicious in their use of it and that they're really respecting that medicine and um, not using more than they need, not taking it more frequently than they truly need it. It's beautiful medicine and it can be done in different kinds of dose ranges. So oftentimes when we talk about Someone doing Ibogaine, we use the term a flood dose of Ibogaine. That's a very high dose of Ibogaine. That's not the only way to do it. You can also have someone take 
something way lower than that. You can also have people even microdose ibogaine or take a little bit of just the root bark tincture just in a little drop here and there. So there are different ways in which ibogaine can be used. Um, they all have their place and different people are going to be needing different things depending on where they're at in their lives. And one more thing I wanna say about Ib ibogaine, which makes it truly an interesting medicine for me is that Ibogaine seems to have more of an effect on chemical receptor sites, like on the physicality of the brain than some of the other psychedelics do. So for example, a lot of the people that I see in my practice have depression. And a lot of people who have depression have been told this story that their depression is a chemical imbalance in their brain. That is the case sometimes, but often that's malarkey. A lot of people who have depression have a trauma history or history of neglect or a negative story that's been bouncing around in their head or some root cause that has nothing to do with their brain chemistry. Psychedelics really shine in helping people like that. But there are some people who truly do have a chemical imbalance component to their depression. And in particular, people who have addiction to opiates the opiates over time cause depression and the opiates over time do actually engender physical changes to the brain and they alter the chemical receptor sites in the brain. And Ibogaine is fantastic at addressing those elements as well as the psychospiritual elements. So sometimes what we see when people take Ibogaine is they, they come back from their experience and they say, I had such an incredible journey on Ibogaine. I met my ancestors. I spoke with them. I got wisdom from them. Then I played through scenes of my childhood and I could see everything from a different angle. And they really come back having had that psychospiritual experience. Other people sometimes come back and they say, that was really weird, kind of confusing. I didn't really like it definitely did not see God, but I have zero craving for opiates right now. I have zero interest in taking an oxy. And we, I explained to those people, it could have been that this time around, it was just about treating your physical addiction. And the next journey might be your psycho-spiritual breakthrough. So I think Ibogaine's really cool in its ability to kind of hard hit the brain chemistry in ways that other psychedelics can, but Ibogaine does it stronger, more strongly. It actually affects the opioid receptor sites in the brain, and it can engender these mystical, beautiful, spiritual experiences for people. Um, it's really, really a beautiful medicine that we're so lucky to have. We need to protect this medicine. We need to stop cutting down the iboga trees. Uh, and harvesting that root bark in irresponsible ways. We really need to respect this medicine so we can continue to have it and share it with other people.